Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Periodic Roundtable. As always, I'm Joel. And I'm Brittany. And today we'll be talking to you about... Getting deep in the blue. Unfortunately, we have had a lot of research in this field that Brittany has done. And I'm very excited to talk about a lot of topics here. But one specifically I want to get to, Brittany, is the Kraken, the colossal squid, the big kahuna, the massive one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Kraken, as well known in Norse mythology, often tied to what we know as the colossal squid or even the giant squid as well. Yes. And the fascinating thing about this is it has been recorded to reach up to 13 meters or 275 kilograms for females. In freedom units, that is 43 feet or 606 pounds, which is pretty sizable. Yes, and what's fascinating is that they actually represent uh, sexual dimorphism. Brittany, what is sexual dimorphism? So sexual dimorphism is something that is seen in most creatures. So the males and the females have uh, different characteristics, both sexual characteristics and physical characteristics. So, for example, in spiders, the females are often larger and they often eat the males. A beautiful, beautiful way to live oh, their life. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> Fascinating. But the Kraken has been found near Europe, North America, Japan, Africa, Australia, the Caribbean, and New Zealand. Now, tying it back to mythology, the Kraken has been known to take down Norse longboats. How large were those boats, Brittany? So those boats were typically 15 to 30 meters in length. So when you think about the size of an actual colossal squid, you know, maybe, but that's pretty unlikely that something like a squid can take down one of those boats. So we're talking on the large scale, a 13 meter squid taking down a 15 meter boat. Right. Mm. And why was that squid so angry at that boat? What did it do to it? <laughs> it was getting too close, too close to the dark one. The large squid, however, has been known to stick to depths typically about 300 to 600 meters down into that deep bloom. And they've never been recorded appropriately as being aggressive towards humans. But as far as bored sailors, perhaps they saw some of these carcasses, started fantasizing the way that they thought about other certain creatures. <laughs> like the gentle sea cow. <laughs> like the beautiful sea cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> if we look at some of the ships being lost at sea or losses of people that never came back, perhaps that was one way to explain the loss of their clansmen. Right. So you see this giant creature, horrifying creature, and your friends are gone? I guess, yeah, sure. Let's tie those two together. That would make sense. Yeah. But... For Norse mythology, that's not the only place where we see these types of lores popping up independently. Brittany, what are some of the other places that we've seen this? So we've actually also found records of something as a giant squid in Maori mythology. So there's something known as Te Weke a Matarangi in Maori mythology. There's also a creature called Akura Kamui in Ainu mythology, which is the people of northern Japan, indigenous people. And my personal favorite is a creature in the Caribbean known as the Luska, which is this ridiculous half shark, half octopus creature. You can also find this in more modern tellings, such as Lovecraftian old gods. I'm yeah. sure many at D&D tables have seen the likes of such. Now, these beautiful, magnificent cephalopods, which are the creatures that, that will rise up when we fall and take over the world. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. Perhaps one of the reasons that we can see these types of mythology growing and continuing even in modern day society is we know so little about the depths of the ocean that's right next to us. Right. So we've actually explored more of the surface of the moon than we have of our own ocean. There's still very little known about these creatures. So we have a lot to learn still about large cephalopods in the deep ocean. And that's not the only large cephalopod. So we have the colossal squid that's been found near Antarctica, about the same size as the giant squid, still around the range of 12 to 15 meters and weighing up to 650 kilograms. Now there has been particularly scientific review over these massive growing creatures, Brittany. 
So there are two different roles that are typically applied to such large creatures in the depths. So one is known as Kleiber's role. This was named by Max Kleiber, who is a biologist in the 1940s. He said that the metabolic rate of a creature is proportional to its mass to the three-fourths. So in simple terms, this means that larger animals are more efficient, and this is more useful in the harsh environments of the deep ocean, because there's less resources, less food, so the bigger you are, you know, the more efficient your body can burn calories. So you're telling me if I want to live better in the deep ocean, I just need to get bigger. Yeah, so just get fatter. Fatter or yeah. just like more... Oh. You need to accumulate mass. Mass, okay, yeah. just Don't skip mass. leg day or tentacle day. Uh, tentacle day. <laughs> we will have to work on tentacle day. <laughs> but the other role that is a little bit more debated though, the Carl's role. Yeah, so Carl Bergman defined another role known you know, surprisingly as Bergman's role. So he said that larger animals are typically found in colder climates and smaller animals are typically found in warmer climates. There's a few problems with this rule. It mainly implies to endotherms or creatures that can make their own heat, also known as mammals in most cases. And also this rule is often debated. Brittany, why is it debated? Because I think about large creatures in colder climates like the polar bear, the sea walruses, or my favorite, the pizzly bears. Right. So you can actually go and look, you know, for yourself and see that the largest land animal that is currently on our planet, the African elephant, isn't really hanging out in cold climates. It hasn't been known to migrate to Antarctica? I think Hannibal tried, you know pushing them through the Alps that didn't really work out too well for them. <laughs> Fair and yeah. accurate. But it's still an interesting rule that has been observed in some of the particular creatures that we can see. But other things about the giant colossal squid has, can be, has been found on sperm whales. Right, so sperm whales also known as the nemesis of the colossal squid, they found that a lot of sperm whales typically have scars that are linked to these colossal squid. And that's because colossal squid tend to have these horrendous barbed hooks on their tentacles. And this would make sense because colossal squid make up to 75% of the major food source for these whales. So you're telling me that all of my imaginations about the massive kraken fighting a huge battle-scarred sperm whale are all real. Yes, isn't that metal as fuck? Oh man, I see a new D&D episode <laughs> in my head. <laughs> the colossal squid, since it is a unfortunately preyed upon creature by these angry, violent sperm whales oh attacking these innocent, beautiful creatures... <laughs> Tell me about some of their defense mechanisms for this. Okay, so if you have ever seen a picture of a colossal squid, you might have noticed a horrifying huge eye. The eye of a colossal squid is usually measured up to 27 centimeters, almost up to one foot. It's not really useful for the darkness of the deep sea because, you know, it's, it's dark down there. However, it is really useful for seeing large approaching objects moving towards it. You know, what's a large approaching object towards a colossal squid? A sperm whale. A sperm whale. Yeah. Hunting down the innocent prey. It's so sad. But being large, I, I wonder what it would be like to see through its eyes just globular, angry images far off in the distance. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll never know. Besides that, we also have something called a leviathan, which is also related to antediluvian mythology that has been back in several different areas of culture. Right, so the leviathan is most commonly known to biblical scholars and, you know, in the Old Testament as this magnificent huge creature that is usually tied to a whale or sometimes a crocodile, a dragon, sometimes even a sea serpent. How can it take so many different forms? Because people are just not accurate when they write stuff down. But it's definitely the body of a crocodile. 650 million years of evolution and its body morphology has not changed. It is clearly an apex predator. Oh yeah, perfect killing machine. Why would you need to change? Why would you need to change? Yeah. If you're at the top, Maybe you just keep going, no matter what. Yeah. All the crocodile does is win. <laughs> you also mentioned sea serpents, Brittany. 
Right. So sea serpents are another common mythological creature that we see in many different mythologies. So some examples are the Scylla in Greek mythology. You also see it in India, Norse mythology, 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 Babylonian mythology as well. Since it's related to the biblical scholars in that particular mythology, I would imagine that the serpents have gotten quite the rap for its activities. Right. So it's usually something that you'd see on old timey maps, you know, a little sea serpent hanging out in far distant oceans. The edge of the world. Right. Exactly. You can imagine, you know, how horrifying something like this was to ancient man, this giant sea serpent. I would imagine so. But if we were to look at actual evidence of the sea serpents, we can see such creatures as the oar fish which I imagine it is a fish that looks like an oar and that I can use to propel my boat. <laughs> I mean, you could try, but it probably wouldn't be too efficient. <laughs> well, it can reach 10.5 meters or 35 freedom units in size. <laughs> that is a large oar, mind you. Right. So these are actually really interesting fish. So they're huge, but they're completely harmless to people. They uh, have claims of finding oarfish of up to 15 meters, and the maximum recorded weight that they found for such a creature was 272 kilograms. However, dead oarfish can wash up on shore, so you can imagine how freaked out somebody would be if they saw something like this hanging out on the beach. That would be massive, but since it typically only lives at 200 meters, I would imagine that we typically don't see it. Yeah, we typically don't. So in Japan, Oarfish are known as the Harbingers of Doom, also Rugo no Tsukai, or the Messengers from the Sea God's Palace. So sightings of oarfish are usually linked to impending earthquakes, and therefore the tsunamis that usually plague Japan, um, because deep sea fish are typically more sensitive to tectonic activity. So therefore, when fishermen would see an oarfish start to come to the surface, it's kind of an oh shit moment, something horrible is about to happen on the mainland. But if you don't know what is actually happening under the sea, you just think that some angry spirit in the deep ocean has decided to send you your own doom. Yeah, pretty much. So if I were to send an oarfish to you in the mail, <laughs> you know your death is pending. Yeah, kind of like a horse head, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are other creatures, though, that have monstrous depictions. Right. So one of my favorites, which I imagine is a angry, green, slimy creature under the ocean, is the goblin shark. Oh man, I love goblin sharks. So goblin sharks are horrifying because they can detach their jaw and send it at other creatures to eat them. Um, there's some great videos online. We'll actually link it on our social media because it's just so cool to look at. But it is definitely, you know pants shitting inducing that's a scary creature if you can send your jaw at me to consume my flesh and then have it return that's almost as bad as the orc shark <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> also a distant cousin of the troll shark oh god i hate you <laughs> Interestingly, connected to that, cephalopods have been known to detach other body parts that they have had on their body. Mm -hmm. For example, there are certain species of cuttlefish that if they don't find a mate, they can actually rip off their penis and throw it in the ocean, and it'll start swimming around to try to find a female, which I find the best way to appropriate as a cephalopod. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean... If that's, you know, your last case scenario, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of appendages hanging off of the body, we also have the anglerfish. Yes, so the anglerfish, um, horrifying in every respect. So typically the anglerfish that you'd see in most documentaries is the female. And the male anglerfish will actually attach to the female by biting onto her underside, where their blood vessels will eventually fuse. And then she has a constant source of sperm. Yeah, it's it's pretty scary. And then, as you know, there's the female anglerfish, the way she hunts, is she has bioluminescence to attract other creatures to her, and then she may eat. After attracting and consuming what comes to her. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So you're telling me that a female dangles something out into the water, mm -hmm. attracts some sort of resource, 
and then ravenously consumes it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Quaint. Yeah. Yes. Parallels. <laughs> Parallels. <laughs> One creature I'm not too familiar with, Brittany, what is a isopod? So an isopod, uh, it's pretty much a living fossil. Think of it as a giant sea cockroach almost. So these things have not evolved for millions of years. Why did, would you need to? They're giant sea cockroaches. What have they got to, you know, work on there? And they have been known to live through the underwater nuclear cold war that ended back in before centuries of about 7,000 when the cephalopods attacked each other and it all <laughs> changed. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Anyways, I'm, I'm sure they can survive another nuclear holocaust. Oh yeah, they'll be fine. Yeah, Beautiful. don't worry Don't worry about them. Now, for those of you that are fans of, let's say, long legs we also have the <laughs> japanese spider crabs yeah japanese spider crabs they are completely harmless creatures yet again but they are freaky looking so these things are huge they're pretty much a little tiny crab body with really long legs so think of like a granddaddy long leg but in crab form wow yeah. that is fascinating yeah another creature i would imagine floating in the ocean dark and luminescent massive things attached to its body <laughs> looking for something supple and sweet <laughs> is the vampire squid that's not it at all <sighs> not at my all. my imagination is wrong yeah it's totally we're going to put a picture of the vampire squid up on our website and you can decide who is right it, okay it's <laughs> It's not that, trust me. They'll agree with me. No, they won't. <laughs> Anyways, the vampire squid. So the vampire squid is actually pretty cute and cuddly looking. An interesting thing that happens to a vampire squid when it comes up to the surface is that it rapidly changes color. So it will go from a deep red color to a deep dark endless black color as soon as it comes to the surface. Why it does that, nobody's really sure of yet. It's not really seen among humans too often because it lives so far down. Right, and this particular ability is linked to their particular cells, which are called chromatophores, which has the capability of changing upon a reaction to stimuli. And the capabilities of cephalopods and chromatophores is actually that it doesn't need to send any information to the central nervous system and can respond on command. There's actually videos of cephalopods able to change and camouflage without having to send signals to their central nervous system, which mm -hmm. is quite fascinating. Yeah, it's really cool, especially if you go back to cuttlefish. Like cuttlefish are the masters of disguise. They can not only change their color, but also their texture. Have you seen one? I have. They are quite cuddly. Oh, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Now we talked about the anglerfish, which uses bioluminescence. The way that this is typically done in the ocean is by using an enzyme called luciferinase, and it uses a protein called luciferin. Now, Lucifer in the ancient times was known as the fallen angel, but the name Lucifer is actually meaning light. So this is how we get the name for this enzyme and this protein. This is known in several different creatures, not only in above water creatures, but also below water creatures. So we have the anglerfish, we also have cnidarians and dinoflagellates, which are capable of lighting up. Brittany, can you shine some light huh? on this topic? <laughs> Not really, no. Okay, well, <laughs> now back in my Florida days, we actually went to lagoons and you're capable of seeing these cnidarians and dinoflagellates light up. It is not quite known why they have this capability, but they react to stimuli in the water. And the best hypothesis laid today by biologists is that as they light up, other larger creatures are capable of seeing whatever prey is eating them at the time and eat that particular predator, thereby saving the rest of their species, which is utterly fascinating. If you ever have the capabilities, let me know that you're in Florida and I will tell you where to go. Neat. But besides that, we also have these creatures that have looked absolutely ugly. So we've mentioned several of these. We also have the mother-in-law fish, which is a nightmare <laughs> unto itself. So Brittany, why are all of these creatures so ugly? Well, you got to think about where they actually evolved. So you're evolving for just pure survival at the deep ocean. 
nobody really cares for one what you're looking like so you think about creatures that kind of live on you know the the land and these are usually trying to attract mates in such ways for example you think of um birds of paradise they attract their mates by doing a funny little dance and it's really pretty and everything these creatures don't really care about that and the way they look is kind of alien compared to how creatures on land are so you're telling me Brittany, that if it's dark and cold and wet that i don't have to worry about my appearance yeah you don't you can be as wow. ugly as you want as ugly as yeah. i want yeah Man, yeah. I'm always turning off the yeah. lights now. <laughs> now, uh. we have these creatures that live underwater. So typically, uh, if you're a scuba diver, you know that 10 meters is approximately one atmosphere of pressure as you are diving down, which is why you have to continually re-equilibrate your system. And if you come up too fast, you'll get the bends or the bubbling of nitrogen inside of your muscle, which does not feel good. Ooh, yeah. Now. We talked about 200, 300, 500 meters below sea level. So that is a massive amount of atmospheric pressure put onto these creatures. So how do they survive, Brittany? So they are actually just evolved to survive like this. They are capable of withstanding great pressures, but you notice a lot of these creatures, if they're brought up to shore, they don't typically survive for very long. So going back to the vampire squid, that might be a response mechanism to the sudden change in pressure. In addition, there's not really a lot of live specimens that they found of these deep sea creatures. So the only way they've been able to record them is at these really, really, really low levels. So just like we're evolved to withstand the pressures of one atmosphere, these creatures are evolved to withstand the pressures of the great deep sea. The other thing about the deep ocean is that there's low oxygen and there's low light. Mm -hmm. So with this the light, we talked about one creature, the colossal squid, which has this massive eye, which can more or less only see objects in the ocean. These other creatures, what is the use of this, this light? How do they get around this darkness, this creepiness that they're just floating in? So there are some creatures that have the bioluminescence that we earlier talked about. There's some creatures that rely only on sound. So for example, whale song. There are some creatures that kind of just float aimlessly in the sea and hope that something lands in their mouth. They have a lot of different strategies for coping with the darkness of the deep sea. Man, it must get lonely. Yeah. Really trying lonely. to find some partner. Yeah. And even when you find them and you use your bioluminescence, they're still ugly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we turn off the light. <laughs> no. The other thing about being down there is the cold temperatures. So up here we have ways to regulate our body temperatures, keep our bodies warm, creatures have fur, there's scales, you can sit on hot rocks. But how do they combat these cold temperatures? How does their body, their fluids not just freeze and become ice? So a lot of these creatures rely on blubber, in some cases especially with mammals. So you'd see with whales, for example, huge, huge amounts of fat on them this helps them combat the the cold beautiful curvaceous fat yes, mind you yes beautiful sleek yes no at every size <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that we have mentioned is since there's so few creatures they have the inability to transverse this entire massive ocean which is much larger than the land that we have they are constantly battling scarce food so these large creatures we've talked about 15 meters of size in that proportion where i talked about i want to go under a diet under a deep deep pressure how do they combat that scarcity of food since you have such massive creatures so a lot of these creatures tend to rely on food sources that are readily and easily available so you think of something like krill or you even think of something that's more microscopic. A lot of There's a lot of filter feeders at the bottom of the ocean. A lot of them just kind of are able to survive off their very low metabolism. So they need to eat much less often. Now we do have questions that we were struggling with. And fortunately, we have an expert, Leah, who will answer a few of these questions. So hi, Leah, how's it going? Going good gone really good you are a marine biologist you said that you're working at a where did you say so i am currently my my masters and my degrees are in marine biology but 
I'm currently working as a stream ecologist um, at Arizona State University. Um, I'm a lab manager in um, a stream ecology lab there. So I'm studying, I think I found the only water job in the Yeah, that's pretty so. impressive. <laughs> so we had a few questions for you about this particular topic. The first question I wanted to ask is about the giant and colossal squid. So do they ever stop growing? And if they don't, is it possible for one to be as large as is claimed in mythology? Giant squid actually are, have... They have about a five-year lifespan. So even though they can grow um, that entire time, they and they can get very large. They can get up to I think the largest recorded one is like is like forty-three feet, which is like about thirty feet or so. And but there hasn't a lot of exaggeration on their size as well. So it's yes, they can keep growing um, their entire lifespan, but you also have to consider like um, things like um they have to be able to feed the entire time um there's going to be a lot of of pressure on that growth um animals also have to think about how they um or they don't essentially think about this but they're um that where they put their energy into so growth versus reproduction is also very important food they consume that energy can either go towards growth um or it can go towards producing eggs and sperm for, for reproduction. A lot of times um, organisms have this whole uh, energy balance thing that they have to go through, especially once they're able to Okay, reproduce. that's interesting. So it's kind of almost like plants when you're growing plants for food, you have to focus on either the growth of the plant itself or the fruit. So exactly. kind of the same thing. Okay. So do you get big and strong or do you make more babies? Yeah, essentially. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Huh, interesting. Do you want to ask the next question? There we go. So, Leo, is it realistically possible for very large whales to consume people? So, okay, so I had no clue. I had to do a lot of research on this question um, to think about it because, so I'm not a marine mammal biologist. Of course, they're always really fun to study and things like that, though. But you have, when you're considering um, large whales, you're thinking of two different kinds. So you have baleen whales, and then you also have toothed whales. So your baleen whales are going to be the big, large filter feeders. They're going to be the larger whales, like the blue whale, the humpback whale, things like that, the whales that get way larger. And when you, when you look at those guys, they have these, these plates um, of baleen in their mouth. Um, that work almost like a toothbrush to filter everything that's coming into their mouth in. Um, and they filter things like krill and all kinds of other stuff. And then they use their tongue to lick a lot of that off and then to swallow everything. Um, but they have really, really small esophagus. Um, so, like, think about, like, a blue whale. They uh, Generally, their esophagus is, like, 4 and 10 inches. I mean, that's a pretty... Um, that thing can like um, expand a little bit at least, um, but they're not small, large objects. It's gonna be really, really tiny things. So essentially, one of those guys could not swallow a person. You'd get stuck in their throat. They'd probably cough you back up or something. Um, it would not work. Whereas like a toothed whale, so things like um, sperm whales or things like that, they have um, they've actually been found to swallow large um, seals and things like that whole. Um, it's not. It's, common but it has been found um so that's technically potentially possible but i couldn't find i've never found any instance where it's actually ever happened or been shown to have happened like there's not um when they do necropsies of whales they have not found like parts of people or entire people in their stomachs essentially so but if their mouth is large enough can I make a small mobile home inside of your mouth? It's going to be a really, really smelly hole. Do you know my home already? <laughs> they eat lots of, I mean, they eat like, like seals and other things that have a lot of blubber and that are going to, when they're decaying, it's going to like, they're going to like, they burp up things and they vomit things like, like people do essentially they also um like living inside their stomach if you actually did make your way down to their stomach that's not going to happen because of their stomach acid alone let alone like all the methane that is created in there so um it's not gonna like you're not gonna be able to survive very long i think it would be really difficult to 
to survive in there um, and live inside, even if even just the mouth, you know. <laughs> I see. So I can't live in their mouth. But if I built a particular satellite house on top of them and ride them into an epic Leviathan battle against the true masters <laughs> of the underworld. <laughs> she is not shaking her head. Yes. <laughs> I think if you, if you really wanted to like live inside of a whale and become like one with a whale you'd probably have to create like your own personal like rov like bubble thing that'll that's like probably torpedo shaped so it goes down the mouth easily and like um has its own i don't know like almost like a like a space station kind of thing only or submarine that you can fully survive in and live inside your stomach that might be interesting all right joel well your dreams have been quashed (laughs) of your all right, so moving on from living inside whales. Um, so now we'd like to talk a little bit about the oarfish. So are uh, there any other strange deep sea creatures that can be mistaken by humans for sea serpents? Oh, oh my gosh, yes. Actually, um, all of those, uh, all of the, the large like sea serpent legends come from, um, were born from like actual um Sea cre- like sea creatures that actually exist uh when you're out on the sea for long periods of time people would come back and they'd like tell all these big fish stories and embellish them and so they all oftentimes like they have um roots in actual creatures so if you look at things um like if you talk about like mermaids or things like that um those come from uh from manatees and dugongs um and then uh, giant squid for the kraken, um, even though it's often like pictured as an octopus, they, they would find pieces of them washed up on the beach, and that would just confirm that that's what, you know, oh, the kraken exists. Even you can look um, at um, Carl, uh, like Linnaeus's book, his original book, um, the Systema Natura, from 1735 and it had the kraken in it it was originally classified as a creature as a cephalopod it was later taken out it was quickly taken out um and it was reclassified in um 1857 as the giant squid officially so it was technically taken out and then put right back in interesting if you look at it over i mean or put back in you know but as a completely different creature in like the general uh general public's mind essentially so you have the kraken um and then but so they were actually finding like pieces of giant squid or they'd see them um in the deep sea like out on the ocean um so that's that's one that was i find that really fascinating that it was actually in your rhythm and then it was just completely taken out because they're like wait this isn't real but yeah so there's there's a lot of different things most of them have have roots and just like embellished fish stories essentially from sailors and things like that and things washed up on the edges. Wow, did you, you know, hear about this 25 foot serpent that's, you know, in the deep and so people yeah, would believe that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you're you're seeing like large fish, like the oarfish and things like that. And um and a lot of it is just pulled up um washed up on beaches um or things like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to ask the yeah. next one? All right. How do these deep sea creatures survive such extreme conditions in the abyss, all of these high pressures, the low oxygen, the cold? How are they able to reproduce in that vast space? And is parthiogenesis possible inside of these creatures? Okay, so okay, this so is one of my one favorite of my- um, topics and, and kind of things to think about is is adaptations of by animals to extreme conditions okay so when you're talking about um the abyssal zone you're talking about animals that are living um almost two miles deep um beneath the ocean surface so you have a lot of weight on top of them with a lot of pressure like you guys said on top of them high pressure um lower oxygen extremely cold waters all those cold waters are just sinking really deep down there um there's no light down there at all that's one of the um the things that they have to deal with so it's called the aphotic zone there's absolutely it's a complete absence of light down there um so so the things that they do like have to contend with are how do you find food how do you reproduce and there's so much space down there i mean um 
the ocean covers such a huge portion of our of our planet and there's so we've we've explored more of the moon than we have of the ocean um core so when you think about that you have all of these different adaptations that are really cool for all these creatures there's so many different ones um i'm going to focus on just a couple of them but essentially when you're talking about pressure first of all um these creatures the the issue with pressure comes in when you have large changes in pressure. So these organisms are, are living down there their entire lives. They're born down there. So they are used to that pressure. The, the issues that they would have to deal with when, um, with pressure would be when they would come to the surface. So if you caught a creature and brought it from the abyss um, and uh, brought it to the surface, that would be, that would create, um, they would essentially um, explode from the amount of pressure that they have. And the opposite happens when we bring things from the top of the surface down to the bottom. So a good experiment that um, has been done in the past is with like a styrofoam cup, essentially. You bring a styrofoam cup from the surface, put it down, you bring it down into um, um, these high pressure areas of the ocean and it will just completely implode and down into this tiny little size just due to the amount of pressure that's on it. So there's space in, in between the, the styrofoam pockets and it kind of compresses it completely. Um, so if you catch a fish from um, even just like 75, 100 feet down and you bring it straight to the surface, the swim bladder, which is the um, buoyancy part of a fish, the part that keeps it um, basically floating where it wants to in the water column, um, will actually come out of its mouth um, and its eyes will like bulge out. So you get the, this like from the, the change in pressure that's happening, essentially. Um, so it's like almost like exploding out of its mouth, essentially. That's um, fine. Yeah, it's crazy. You can look up pictures of it and everything like that. I'll try and I'll send you a link to some. Um, but when you're talking about creatures that are coming from like uh, two miles down, like you, they, they wouldn't survive that. So down there, some of the things that they deal with, um, with, some of the ways they deal with that is they don't have a lot of like gas-filled organs. So the fish down there don't have those gas-filled swim bladders, essentially. Um, creatures down there don't, aren't going to have lungs or other things like that as well. Um, and they have, their, their bodies are a lot of water. Um, so there's a lot of water instead of gases that are in their body systems. Um, which you can't, and you can't compress water. So like you, if you have um, a glass of water, you can't compress the water down um, even further if you wanted to. It's just going to splash off the side or, or anything like that. Um, so, so that's one of the ways they deal with pressure. You're talking about um, um, like reproduction, like finding a mate and other things like that, and also food. Um, a lot of these creatures are going to have really, really slow metabolism. Um, that's one thing. They're going to grow very slowly. Um, they're going to have, a lot of them will have longer lives. There's this um, term that they have called gigantism. So there will be things like um, isopods that because they're growing so slowly and their metabolism is so slow, they have these almost infinite lives. It's just ridiculously long lives. And an isopod is essentially, they're related to uh, roly polies on land, okay? They're, they're kind of closely, it's another um, arthropod. And so if you know, if you think about a roly-poly, it's kind of like a, a roly-poly in the ocean, essentially. Um, there's lots of different kinds of isopods, but the ones that live down there, instead of being, you know, like a couple centimeters long, they're gonna be like up to, you know, a foot and a half to long, and they'll just be huge in comparison. So it's these like giant roly-polies that'll live down there. Um, and so, uh, they just they have these really slow metabolisms. They don't have to feed as often. Um, larger sharks and things like that are going to have to um, be able to process a lot more efficiently as well. Um, so they're going to have to try and figure out. Most of them are going to have like longer digestive tracts so that they absorb more of the, the nutrients and energy from the food um, that they eat. And oftentimes they'll only eat like you know, maybe once or twice a month and they're feeding on just whatever they can find with a lot of scavengers and things like down there, that down there. Um, and a lot of creatures will have uh, bioluminescence to attract mates or prey to them as well. So they'll have um, kind of like a firefly where they'll have 
has little lights that are attached all over their body. Like an angler fish will have basically a little lure that sticks out of its head out to the front and kind of dangles around and has um, uh, a bioluminescent uh, enzyme in it. And um, it'll attract prey. It also attracts a mate. Um, uh, one really crazy thing about anglerfish also is a lot of them, once they do attract a mate, the females are going to be larger than the males. And a lot of them, um, the males will actually become parasitic and attach themselves to the female. And um, they'll grow into like one creature and it will stay, the male will stay with that fish for the rest of its life, which is kind of crazy. So um, it's extreme form of marriage, I guess, in that regard, right? <laughs> become one person or something. That's interesting because some of the stuff that you were talking about there is stuff that we actually discussed in, in the first recording that we did. So that's kind of cool that it's, it kind of links together here. So, yeah, yeah like, uh, so the next question I have was like about longevity, but you kind of covered that in some of the other ones. So we'll just skip that okay. one um, and we'll go to more towards the philosophical questions. So. Okay. Um, my question is, what can an everyday person do to reduce their negative impact on the health of our oceans? Because we are responsible for not only polluting the oceans, filling it with plastic, but also responsible for increasing the acidity of the ocean as well, which has a negative yeah. effect on these shelled creatures. So what can I do personally to help reduce that impact? Okay, so, so you can drive yourself crazy and make yourself sick worrying about all of the big changes that need to happen in the world. Yes. The, you know, with, with everything that's going on right now, um, ocean acidification and everything like that, you can make yourself just completely sick. But, um, especially, you know, with someone, you know, like for me, it's, it's really difficult for me to try and think about those things and just not be completely overwhelmed with everything that's going on. Um, but there's, the director of the Pascal Audubon Center um, in Mississippi, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, um, his name is Mark LaSalle. He really helped me with this, with this um, emotional problem that I was having, this emotional connection to these, these like large, um, large problems with the whole world. Um, and he really, he told me that um, what you really have to do is just focus on um, the ground you walk on, take care of the ground you're walking on, you know, take care of the ground that is under your feet. And the best ways to do that are just to, um, in your own personal life, try and, um, reduce your waste, essentially, not just recycling. Recycling is an okay option, but it takes a lot of energy to recycle things. A lot of times people don't understand what you can and can't recycle. So that kind of education is also important. But reducing the amount of waste that you produce is going to be one of the largest impacts you can have over your entire lifetime, your entire lifespan. So, so like um, that saying, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle is actually in order. You're supposed to reduce exactly. the most, reuse what you can't reduce, and then recycle whatever's left over. It should be the backup, essentially. Um, so... Um, yeah, so reducing and reusing are going to be the top two, of, of course, especially reduction. Um, and, you know, so that's going to be a big thing, especially with plastics. Plastics are a big one because those, um, we have the huge, you know, Great Pacific uh, patch in the ocean with all the plastic in it. Um, we're finding all kinds of creatures in Antarctica, blue dissections of things there. We find plastic in their stomachs, a lot of birds. Um, who may have never even met a human are winding up stomachs full of plastics. Um, and there's so many different, um, so many bad impacts that, the, that those are having. So just reducing that use is going to be the biggest one. Um, also with, in regards to the ocean, sustainable seafood is another important part. We are, there's so many different um, fisheries that are just completely overfished right now. Um, and some of the things there's, I'm going to, I'm going to send you a link to, a really, really good resource that helps you um, when you're in the grocery store just thinking about sustainable forms of seafood because um, I know people that just like in this field that just don't even eat seafood at all. I can't do that. I grew up on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi. I've had, a, you know, I've been eating seafood my entire life, you know, but I just really try and focus on 
um, sustainable seafoods, like fresh farm seafoods from local farms, if you can help it, um, getting things from, from across the ocean and, you know, isn't really going to help being in the sustainability aspect either. So, um, also just trying to, you know, catch your own is also a good way to do it. Um, but I'm going to send you a link to just some, like I said, the sustainable, a list of like sustainable seafood sources, essentially. Um, and some things that are definitely not sustainable as well. Um, because it's just, it's, it's such a good thing to, um, to kind of just keep in the back of your mind when you're grocery shopping or even when you're out at a restaurant, you know, I always try to ask, um, do you know where this is from? Did you get this locally? Um, you know, and, or things like that, if I can help it now on that end, are they going to tell you the truth? Hopefully, you know, um, I know some restaurants will have certified seafood sources. Um, so that's always a good, a good thing to ask as well. Do you have, um, do you certify your seafood where it comes from and things like that as well. So, okay. well, I've certainly learned a lot, but even though I've learned a lot here, Brittany, there's still so much I don't know about the deep sea. There's so much as a species we still don't understand. It's so hard to study these creatures, so hard to get down there. And even if we are able to get down there, we can't bring them back up. They'll just die and we mm -hmm. won't be able to study their bodies. Even in our modern society, we have the inability to truly understand these glorious, magnificent, and mysterious creatures. Right. And in addition, we are not biology STEM students. So that eliminates one. That eliminates one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating to see and understand why all of these separate communities built up these lores about these creatures. Right. So we not only don't understand them very well in the present, but you can understand how little people understood them in the past. Uh, people in the past didn't have great science, of course. And so they came up with these mythologies to kind of explain things that they didn't quite understand yet. And even now, we still have a lot of questions that we need to answer. So why has Krog, Flog, and Flangugan not returned from their sailing vessel? Obviously, they were taken down by the mighty Kraken. No, no, no. Well, this has been a fascinating episode. Thank you for joining us for Deep in the Bloom. And we will be back next week with another episode. But for all of the creatures that we've mentioned here, you can find us on social media. That's right. You could find us on Facebook. Uh, just search for us under Periodic Roundtable. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under PRTCast. And we would also like to thank Leah Gaines for all of her knowledge and information that we've gained from her. And in addition, next week, Brittany, what will we be talking about? So next week, we'll be talking about the science of sleep. The most hated and dreaded of hobbies I have. <laughs> My favorite hobby in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, if you agree with Brittany or I, you can let us know. But we will be talking about the pros and cons of skipping sleep, the capabilities of doing more with your day, but perhaps some of the deleterious effects that you will encounter. Right. So what kinds of diseases and what kinds of psychotic effects can arise from getting not enough sleep? Did you call me crazy? Just a little bit. Okay. Well, mm. the voices are telling me it's time to end the podcast. So thank you all for listening. And again... This is the Periodic Roundtable, and we will see you again next week.